Okay, welcome back everybody. So today we're going to continue talking about the numerical integration of ODEs. Okay, uh, we're going to code up the forward and backward Euler schemes that we derived in the last lecture and we're going to try them out on two examples and look at how accurate they are and how stable they are. Okay, so for numerical integration, the two things that we always care about are accuracy and stability. Okay, and we're going to kind of get to the bottom of what that means in this lecture. And then in the next two lectures, we're going to cook up way more advanced integration schemes that are a lot better than forward and backward Euler. And we're going to start applying them to really, really complicated ODEs that are chaotic. Um, and we're going to look at some kind of advanced topics that probably most of you, and, you know, haven't seen before. Okay? So just a little bit of a refresher. And please you know, feel free to interrupt at any time. So we have some differential equation, x dot equals f of x, that we're going to solve. And usually, kind of early on in school, solving this means writing something down on the board or on your paper in closed form. But then we grow up and we get real problems. And real problems can't be solved in closed form. OK, so this was famously uh, discovered, in fact, the the word chaos basically means that you can't write down a closed form solution to this equation. Okay, so at the turn of the last century, in 1906, uh, there was a contest that was held by, uh, I believe, the king of Sweden. Maybe not the king of Sweden. One of the kings, a great king, uh, essentially, yeah, not the king of Sweden, <laughs> um, essentially held a contest to see who could solve the three-body problem. Okay, he loved astronomy. He realized that most of the great advances in technology and science at that point had come from uh, astronomy. Okay, telescopes and physics and Newton's laws and the whole bit. And so he thought that this is the next unsolved problem uh, in astrophysics was the three-body problem. What happens when you put three massive objects in space and let them interact? Right? Shouldn't be too hard of a problem. The two-body problem was solved by Kepler hundreds of years earlier. So he said, okay, anyone who solves the three-body problem gets riches and fames, and I'll fund your lab forever, basically. Um, so Henri Poincaré, most of you have probably heard uh, the name Poincaré at some point, famously discovered that for the three-body problem, this is one of the simp simplest problems you can write down in physics. I literally have the Sun, Jupiter, and Saturn, and I let them just do what they will. And Poincaré discovered that you can't write down a solution. There is no way, there's no amount of paper or pencil that you can write down the solution to this system of equations. And moreover, if you perturb any of the variables or masses or positions by a tiny little epsilon, the solution changes kind of exponentially far from the original solution as you evolve in time. Okay, and he discovered chaos. So, most real systems, you can't write down a closed form solution for. It's hopeless. We will never write down a closed form solution to most systems that we care about. And so when I say solve a system, I mean find some way of numerically representing the solutions of this system in a way that we gain understanding about the engineering system, how to design it, how to change it, how to choose initial conditions, how to control it. Okay, it's a little bit of a historical aside, but I really want to emphasize that even very, very simple systems are often chaotic or nasty or hard to represent. Okay, okay so just um, kind of a review of what we did last time. So we had two schemes that we cooked up. The forward Euler, it's not Euler, it's Euler. Forward Euler is uh, xk plus 1 equals xk plus delta t f of xk. Okay, so I have to choose a time step for this numerical integration, and I'm going to take my state at some time tk, and I'm going to advance it to time tk plus 1, which is delta t in the future. And I'm going to keep doing that over and over and over again, and this defines a trajectory or a numerical solution to my ODE. Uh, if we were really lucky and our differential equation was a matrix linear system of differential equations, which we actually can solve, then we would write this as x, we would write this as the identity plus delta t times our A matrix times xk. 
forward Euler. Okay, and then we also have backward Euler, uh, which is a slightly more clever scheme, but it's also not just slightly, it's much harder to implement for nonlinear systems. Okay, so this one we have uh, x of k plus 1 equals xk plus delta t f of xk plus 1. Seems like a really, really subtle distinction, right? I just changed the subscript index of the function of xk plus 1 here. But what that means is that now my future state, xk plus 1, is implicitly defined, which makes it really, really hard to solve for. Again, unless my system's linear, in which case I have something like i minus delta t a inverse times xk. Okay. Any questions so far? This is just a review at this point, but important stuff. Okay, so there's two things I want you to be thinking about. I want you to be thinking about accuracy, two c's. Accuracy has two c's, yeah. It seems strange, but when you're in front of a board, you can't spell anything. <laughs> so accuracy and stability. And so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to talk about accuracy. Okay, we're going to actually code this up. We're going to see how it performs. But in the back of your minds, I want you to be thinking about the problem of stability. And the way we're going to think about this is as follows. This scheme is an iteration Okay, so I have x1 and I can get x2 by multiplying with the matrix. And if I have x2, I get x3 by multiplying with the same matrix. And x4 by multiplying with the same matrix. So let's think about a general iteration, xk plus 1 equals some matrix M times xk. That's what we have here. This is just some matrix M. And this is just some matrix M. And so what that allows us to do is it allows us to take our initial condition and go to some state at delta t in the future. And then we can go to some other state, delta t, you know, 2 delta t in the future, and 3 delta t in the future, and so on and so forth. This problem just got a lot easier. Okay, and so we have x0, m x0, right? x1 is just m times x0. x2 is m squared x0 x3 is m cubed x0, and so on, so that xn is m to the power n x0. So at least for linear systems, which is where we can do stability analysis mathematically, we have some iteration equation where if we know some initial condition, we can solve for the trajectory by multiplying by the same matrix over and over again. So I want you to be thinking about under what conditions this trajectory is stable and converges to zero or is unstable and diverges from zero. Just in the back of your minds, OK? OK, so let's actually code these up for a simple example and think about accuracy. And we're going to revisit the stability problem after we do some numerical simulations. Uh, so the problem that we're going to solve is the spring mass damper. Okay, so we have a spring and a damper attached to a mass M. Uh, the position X is going to be the displacement from equilibrium. And I'm going to skip all of the derivation because we've already done this, and I'm just going to write down the equation. We have X double dot plus 2 zeta omega naught X dot plus omega naught squared x equals 0. OK, I've introduced these super fancy Greek letters here. Zeta is just the damping ratio. Some uh, spring constant divided by, sorry, this is the damping constant divided by 2 times the spring constant mass square root. doesn't really matter. Uh, and omega naught is the natural frequency square root of the spring constant divided by the mass. Just these are just numbers, okay? This is the damping ratio. This is the natural frequency of the system. This is a convenient way of writing the system. And so we can write this as a system of first order equations like before. And we get ddt 
of x and v equals 0, 1. OK, so x dot equals v. And v dot equals minus this minus that. OK, which is, I think, minus omega naught squared minus 2 zeta omega naught times x and v. I'm going fast because we've already written this equation lots and lots of times. I just am introducing different constants because I like this parameterization of the problem better than mass and spring constant. OK? These are like, this is a physics parameterization. OK, great. We have an A matrix, and we're going to solve this using forward Euler and backward Euler. Any questions about the derivation before we jump into MATLAB? Okay. Okay. Um, this is not engineering math. OK, good. So we're going to code up um, our example. And we're going to do it for a couple of different cases. We're going to do it for the case of an overdamped system and an underdamped system so that we get you know, nice undamped oscillations. And we're going to see how the stability of our algorithm goes. OK? So we're going to clear all. Uh, I'm going to define my parameters. Like the natural frequency is going to be 2 pi. The damping ratio is going to be 1.75. And I'm going to define my A matrix is 0, 1, d minus W squared, minus 2 times D times W. Okay, in MATLAB, my zeta variable is just D, because I don't want to type zeta. Okay. Okay, DT is, let's just pick a DT of 0.1. It's small, but it's not too small. OK, so this will kind of have some inaccuracy that we'll see. Uh, and let's integrate from 0 to 10 in increments of 0.1. So I should probably comment my code. This is an initial condition. Sorry, not initial condition. This is the amount of time to integrate. OK, uh, this is my time step, my A matrix. OK. And now my initial condition, uh, x naught, is going to be 2, 0, which I think I've used before. So 2, 0, what does this initial condition physically correspond to in the spring mass system? Okay, I take this mass, I pull it two units of position off of equilibrium, and I let it go with zero velocity. I don't push it, I don't pull it, I just I pull it to two units off, and I let it go. And what's going to happen? going to oscillate, and it's going to die out eventually and go back to equilibrium. Okay, And the oscillation frequency is determined by omega. And how fast it damps out is determined by how big this d is. Okay, Bigger d, faster damping, I think. Should be. OK, so now we're going to iterate our forward Euler scheme. OK, and there's a couple ways to do this. How do I want to do this? Um, So my initial condition is a column vector, right? 2 colon 0, it's a column vector. So what I'm going to do is every time I iterate my forward Euler scheme, I go from x0 to x1 to x2 and so on, I'm going to tack on a new column vector into a big matrix. So I'm going to make a big matrix, and that big matrix is going to have a ton of column vectors with two elements in each column vector. And that's going to be my trajectory in time. So as you read this matrix from left to right, that's going to be time advancing. Okay. So I'm going to call it xf because we're doing forward Euler. And the first column of xf, you know, colon, comma, 1, is equal to my x0, my initial condition. OK, and I'm also going to keep track of my vector of time and say that at time 1, it's time 0. So I'm going to have a vector of time starting at 0, and I'm going to add delta t to it every step. OK, so for i equals 1 to big t divided by delta t, 
right, this is how many time steps I'm going to take. So I'm going to go up to a duration of 10 in increments of 0.1. Then I'm going to say, OK, well, my new time is my i times dt. And my position is equal to, so my new column vector of my state is going to be identity plus a delta t times my old state. That's this formula right here. Okay, so x, f at the next time step is identity plus delta t a times my old state. So that's identity 2 by 2 plus a delta t times my old state, the ith column. Should I change this to k's? Would k's be better? I use k's in all of my math. That would be fine. We can just say this is k, k. Here we go. We have a few more. These are all k's, OK? This is the exact same notation that we're using here. So we're counting up our time index k. And the k plus 1 state depends on the k state according to this formula. And that's, oof, messed that up. And that's it. That's forward Euler. OK, any questions about the implementation of this before we run it? No? OK, maybe I'll run it, and then you'll have questions. Uh, and then we want to plot some stuff, right? So I want to plot my time versus my state. Uh, and I just want the first position of my state, not the velocity. So I'm just going to plot the first row in black. X label is time. Y label is position. Hold on. Ah, this is uh, sim mass. OK. OK, so this is, you know, my, I started at a really big initial displacement. I let it go, and it's damping out exponentially. And on top of that exponential damping, there is an oscillation. This isn't exactly what I pictured. Um, Let's see. Um, maybe I'll try a little bit less damping and a smaller uh, initial condition. Oh, that's unstable. That's terrible. OK, so my numerical scheme thinks that the solution is blowing up to infinity. But we know that that's not actually happening in the physics, right? If we solve for the eigenvalues, they would be stable, left half plane eigenvalues. So this is bad. I'm going to add more damping. <laughs> that was the wrong direction. OK. So let's try a different scheme. I don't think forward Euler is working very well. OK, so for backward Euler, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say uh, we're going to have this big matrix that is keeping track of our state in time. The first column is x naught. My first time point is 0. And for uh, k equals 1 to t divided by delta t, tb of k plus 1 equals k dt. And xb of the k plus 1th column. So the k plus 1th column of my state is going to depend on the kth column according to i minus delta t a inverse. So let's see. Inv of a 2 by 2 identity minus a delta t times x b colon comma k. OK. Um, And I'm going to make my damping. Let's try. Uh, let's try one. 
Okay, so the black curve was forward Euler. The red curve is um, backward Euler. Let's see if I make this like 0.75. I'm trying to get some interesting behavior here without killing my system. Let's try this, okay? So I have decreased my damping so that this is an underdamp system, so we would expect kind of damped oscillations, but you know, still seeing oscillations. And we see, uh, let me put a legend up. We have forward Euler and backward Euler. Okay, so forward Euler appears to think that the system is a lot less stable. Right, it's a lot more ringy. That means it's a lot closer to instability. And the red solution, backward Euler, is uh, a lot more damped. Okay, so how would I tell which of these solutions is true? What do I do to, to see if these are, like, what's actually true? Sorry? We can compare to critical damping and say. Okay, so we can take a numerical case where we know that the system is critically damped and see what it does. Um, what are some other things we can do with our numerical schemes? Let's say that I didn't know what the solution of this was. Sorry? Okay, I could check the eigenvalues. Let's say that this was a system where I didn't even have an A matrix. This is just, you know, some system I integrated. What would I do? To get a more accurate solution. You could try to cook up a better scheme, you know, for the derivative using central difference or something like that. I mean, this is simpler, okay? This is based on the, the finite difference derivative for x dots. And how do you make that derivative be a better approximation? Make delta t smaller, right? So I could decrease delta t in both of these cases, and they should get closer to each other, hopefully. So let's try that. Um, let's try making delta t 0.01. This is going to take a while. Okay, good, and they're agreeing much better, right? Make delta T smaller, and they agree a lot better. And we see that backward Euler was more accurate all along, right? This is more what backward Euler looked like, even for a bigger DT. Um, something else we can do is we can try using ODE45. Okay, so ODE45 is way, way, way more accurate than either of these two schemes. And this is going to be kind of our truth measurement for a little while, at least for non-chaotic systems. So we're going to integrate this also using ODE45 and just see how it compares. So for ODE45, we've done this before. Uh, the outputs are time and my state x. And it's equal to ODE45 of a function of t comma x of a times x from 0 in increments of dt to big T starting at x naught. Remember, ODE45 takes in three inputs, some function to integrate, the right-hand side of x dot equals f of x, some time span to integrate through, and some initial condition x naught. And we have all of those things. OK, and now I need to plot it. So I'm going to plot t by x first column and instead of being row-oriented, ODE45 gives me two really long columns. And I'm going to plot that in blue. OK, there we go. So the true solution, the ODE45 solution, is this blue curve. And we see that for a big coarse DT of 0.1, both forward and backward Euler get it wrong but they get it wrong in different ways. Okay, so backward Euler has a ton of inaccuracy. It gets the time constants all wrong. And so does uh, forward Euler, but forward Euler is more unstable when it does it. It's more ringy, it's closer to going unstable. Okay, any questions about the MATLAB code or the interpretation of these plots or what the numerical integration is doing? Okay, big picture. Forward Euler is less stable. We'll see why in a minute. Both forward and backward, backward Euler are pretty inaccurate, but we can make them more accurate by decreasing the DT. Okay? 
let's just run this with a smaller dt one more time. Okay, for a smaller dt of 0.01, they all agree much, much better with the fourth order integrator, ODE45. Okay, uh, we'll come back to MATLAB a bit later, but let's uh, do a little bit more math. Okay, good. Um, so now what we're going to talk about are accuracy and stability from a mathematical standpoint on a simple linear system where we know what the answer is. Okay, so the spring mass damper system, the reason we're simulating this and not jumping into some really nasty chaotic problem is that this system is linear and we know exactly what it's supposed to do. So we know exactly how wrong our uh, forward and backward Euler schemes are at every time step. Okay? Um, so in the course notes, there is a small discussion explaining what the accuracy of these two methods are. And this is not a numerical analysis class, and I'm not going to cover this right now, but you can go look at it and see for yourself why these things are true. Um, I'm just going to write down a summary of what the, what the answers are. So, okay, so for accuracy, we have forward Euler and backward Euler. And let's say we also have Runga, Kata, sorry, ODE45. Okay. And then again, we have the local and global error. So remember, we talked about local versus global error last time in the case of numerical integration. Okay, so forward Euler and backward Euler both have a local error of order delta t squared. Okay? Meaning every single time you do this iteration of forward and backward Euler, you pick up a little delta t squared error term. Okay? You could figure this out by doing some Taylor series expansion, and it's all in the notes. I'm not going to go into it. So if I want to make this local error better, I decrease delta t, right? If I want it to be 100 times better, I make delta t 10 times smaller. But if I make my delta t 10 times smaller, I have to take 10 times more steps, and so my global error is order delta t. Does that make sense? I mean, I didn't explain why this is order delta t squared, but if you take my word that it is, then every little, every time you step forward this trajectory, you pick up a delta t squared, and you have about 1 over delta t of these time steps. Okay, so that global error is delta t. ODE45, the built-in MATLAB command that we've been using, has a local error of, I think, about delta t to the fifth, which means that its global error is about delta t to the fourth. I say about because it does some funny things. It's not, it's not a fixed time step integrator. But in, it's in the ballpark of a delta t to the fourth order accurate integrator. Okay? Which, I mean, Compare the differences between these, right? If I want my integrator to be 10,000 times more accurate, for forward and backward Euler, I need to take 10,000 times more time steps. For ODE45, I just need to take 10 more time steps. Kind of amazing, OK? So it's way, way, way better scaling. So ODE45 is kind of our all-purpose uh, integrator. It's not the best one in the book, but it's very good, it's standard, it's easy, and it's built in. So we're going to always use that as kind of our first attempt integrator. And unless we need something better, we're going to use ODE45. OK, good. That's what I want to say about error. Um, now I want to talk about stability, and I want to go a little more into depth about stability because this is kind of uh, important. And it's also something that we're prepared to really understand now that we know about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. OK. Um, so when we're talking about stability, 
we can only analyze stability for the case of linear dynamics, x dot equals a times x. And in that case, we know that our iteration equation for this trajectory is essentially just multiplication by some matrix M. Okay? Now, this is a little tricky, and I want to say this a couple times because it's really important too. Okay, so when we had continuous time, so for continuous ODEs like x dot equals a times x, when is this solution stable? So I'm going to say stable when what? The eigenvalues of A have negative real part. So when the eigs of A, when the real part of the eigs of A are less than zero, meaning I have some complex plane where all of my eigenvalues live, and they're all in the left half plane. They all have negative real part. The first eigenvalue that crosses over into the positive real half plane so that this real part of the eigenvalue is positive makes my system have exponential growth. Okay, any eigenvalues in the right half plane will cause an unstable system. So for stability, it's only when all of the eigenvalues are in the left half plane. Okay, there's a slightly different situation for this discrete time system. I'm calling it discrete time because we're calculating our trajectory at discrete delta t's. So for discrete, uh, I'm going to call it, it's not really an ODE, but for discrete iteration equation, like xk plus 1 equals m xk, this is stable when, anybody know when this discrete system is stable? How many of you have seen this before and have some idea of when the system is stable? Okay, how many of you don't know and are wondering why I'm holding out on you? Okay, so in this equation here, we know that our solution is x naught, m x naught, m squared x naught, m cubed x naught, dot, 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 dot. We just multiply by m more and more and more. Now, let's say that m, m is a matrix, so it has eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So I can write m as t, d, t inverse, just like we could do with a. Except now I'm not taking e to the m, I'm taking m to the nth power. I'm not, I'm not exponentiating this matrix m, I'm just taking like a multiple powers of m. So m to the power, you know, k is t, d to the k, t inverse. When is this matrix going to get really ridiculously large? when any of these diagonal eigenvalues are bigger than 1. And when is this going to be really, really, really small? When all of my eigenvalues in D are, have magnitude less than 1. Okay, I'm going to write it down, then we're going to say it one more time. So this is stable when all eigs of M have length in the complex plane less than 1. So there's this unit circle in the complex plane where if I'm at 1 or i or square root of 2 over 2, 1 plus i, I have unit length. This is the unit circle in the complex plane. And as long as all of my eigenvalues are inside this unit circle, then m to the k, limit as k goes to infinity, equals 0. Okay, this m to the k will converge to 0 as long as all of its eigenvalues are inside the unit circle. Does this kind of make sense? 
Like, let's look at this uh, m k equals t d t inverse, and my d is to the power k. So d is a matrix, lambda 1 to the k, lambda 2 to the k, dot, 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 lambda n to the k. Zero is everywhere else. That's what this is. And if any one of these lambdas is bigger than 1, then this blows up to infinity as k goes to infinity. So let's try lambda equals 1.1. 1 .1. What's 1.1 1 .1 to the 1,000 power? I don't know the answer. It's huge. It's really, really huge, right? 1.1 1 .1 times 1.1 1 .1 is 1.21. Times another 1.1 1 .1 is 1.3, and so on. And it keeps adding and adding and adding. So this goes to infinity as the power k goes to infinity. Let's try lambda equals 0.9. What if I take 0.9 to the thousandth power? Basically 0, right? 0.9 squared is 0.81. That's smaller. Times another 0.9 is 0.72. That's smaller. And it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And this goes to 0. OK? So this iteration will go to 0 as long as all of the eigenvalues of m have magnitude less than 1 in the, in the complex plane. If any of them is outside of here, then this eigenvalue will cause my numerical solution to go to infinity, which is what we saw in the numerical example, right? My, my numerics thought that the spring mass was going to infinity even when the continuous system was stable. OK, uh, I'd like to pause for questions at this point, because the next part's going to be deeper. So yeah. So if like, lambda was negative 1.1, would it oscillate out to infinity? That's exactly right. If lambda was negative 1.1, so it sat over here, but outside the unit circle, the magnitude would keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but the sign's going to flip. And if I'm at some theta, with a mag like say I'm at some angle with a magnitude greater than one, then I'm going as I square and cube and quadruple m, my magnitude's going to increase, and I'm going to pick up that additional angle every time I multiply. That's how complex numbers work, right? If I have if I have some lambda equals magnitude e to the i theta, that's like this point here. The length is r, and this is theta. Then lambda to the nth power is r to the n, e to the i, n theta. So I pick up n of those thetas, and my radius is taken to the nth power. Yeah, good question. OK, other questions, yeah? So the example you put of that only would work in the case where the ODE is linear? Um, the, this analysis is only simple when my ODE was linear. Because this, this is only a matrix M when my original ODE was linear. Yeah, exactly. Good question. And what we saw is that it's possible to have a true system that is actually stable, but where our numerical solution is unstable. So we're going to see how that could possibly be true now. Are there any other questions about when this discrete time system is stable, though? Does essentially make sense? If I keep multiplying by m, it gets really big if any of my eigenvalues have magnitude bigger than 1, and it gets really small if they have magnitude less than 1. OK. So we're going to analyze these uh, stability, and I think that's probably all we're going to have time for today. And then we're going to start solving problems that are so complicated we can't really think about stability except as a cartoon using these examples. OK. Um, so let's take, let's just do a full, a full example from scratch, OK? And I'm going to do it on the simplest linear one dimensional, one variable ODE I can think of because this is still complicated. So our example is going to be, uh, I'm calling this y, y dot equals lambda y. 
one variable linear, the solution is e to the lambda t. And we have some initial condition y of 0 equals y naught. Okay, so forward Euler, so, so first of all, this is stable if the real part of lambda is less than 0. Okay, so forward Euler is yk plus 1 equals, so identity plus a delta t is just 1 plus delta t lambda times yk. Okay, backward Euler is yk plus 1 equals, okay, it was the inverse of identity minus a delta t, but these are just numbers, so it's 1 minus delta t lambda inverse times yk. Pretty simple, right? Forward and backward Euler. Okay, so forward Euler, we have this trajectory. Why not goes to y1, goes to y2, goes to dot, 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 to yn. And this yn is this number to the nth power times y0. Okay? So yn equals 1 plus delta t lambda to the nth power times y0. This is essentially my matrix M if M was just a number. And similarly for backward Euler, we have yn equals 1 plus delta t. To the 1 minus delta t lambda to the minus nth power, why not? That's my m to the nth power. Questions about this derivation? Literally just taking this linear one dimensional ODE and implementing forward and backward Euler, and then just seeing like what happens after n iterations. And I want to know, does this system blow up or shrink to zero? So now what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's imagine that lambda really is a stable eigenvalue. So let's say that lambda has a real part that's negative, so that this definitely should be stable and the solution should go to zero. All right, so our system is stable. The solution should go to zero. Now we're going to see when these numerical solutions are stable and go to zero. Okay? So, okay, so when is forward Euler stable? Stable if and only if. So it's stable if and only if this number has magnitude less than 1 in the complex plane. So it's stable if and only if um, the length of 1 plus delta t lambda is less than 1 in the complex plane, which is just another way of saying unstable if 1 plus lambda delta t is greater than 1. It's neutrally stable if it's equal to 1. And backward Euler is stable if this thing has magnitude, sorry, this thing to the negative 1 has magnitude less than 1 in the complex plane. 1 plus delta t, 1 minus delta t lambda to the negative 1 power is this. and unstable if 1 minus delta t lambda to the negative 1 power is bigger than 1 in the complex plane. Okay, so this is a little bit nasty mathematically, but basically what we're seeing is for this 
linear system that I've chosen to be stable. There are delta t's that could make the numerical integration scheme stable, but there's also delta t's that could make this go unstable numerically. Our simulation could go unstable, even though my real system is stable, if I choose my delta t so that this number is bigger than 1. Okay? Which is a little scary. That means that we can't trust our numerics. Always. We can't, like, you could never trust your numerics without doing some verification. Okay? All right, so let's look at what this, uh, how this looks in the complex plane. So we're going to say, OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix my delta t. And we're going to look at for what lambda the system is actually stable. And this will probably require a little bit of verification. OK, so for forward Euler and for backward Euler, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that delta t lambda equals some complex variable z. So 1 plus z has to have magnitude inside the unit circle for forward Euler to be stable. OK? So what that means is that my numerical integration is only stable if z is in this very small circle and it's unstable everywhere else. So delta t times lambda, if it happens to be in this very small unit circle centered around negative 1, then my numerical scheme will be stable. But for any other delta t times lambda, my numerical scheme will be unstable, even if lambda is negative, which is bad. This is terrible. This is really bad out here. This is a bad no man's land where lots of people's codes live. Okay. Backward Euler is a little bit better. It turns out that most of space is stable. So if your z, your, your delta t times lambda lives anywhere out here, you happen to be stable, which is good. And there's this little island of instability out here, which is really bad. So even for backward Euler, there are some unfortunate choices of delta t. If your delta t is too large, then your system will become unstable. So what I want you to do uh, to verify this on your own, this is first of all really important, um, and I don't have kind of a whole class to tell you all about numerical stability of integrators, but this is very important. At some point in your careers, everyone's going to be doing numerical integration, and you should know when your answer is accurate or not, whether or not it's stable. You want to know if your simulation is stable and your system stable, or if maybe your simulation is disagreeing with the real system because you're having a bad, a bad integrator. So a um, kind of upshot is if I start with a stable integrator and I increase my delta t, it will make my system go unstable. That's true for all forward Euler schemes. If you, take, if you take a forward Euler scheme with a stable delta t and you just start ratcheting that delta t up, you will go into this unstable region. So it's kind of defined by large delta t. This is also defined by large delta t. So ratcheting up your delta t will also cause backward Euler to go unstable. But because it's 1 minus delta t lambda inverse, it's relegated to this relatively small portion of the complex plane. OK, that's it for stability. Next time, we're going to start doing real simulations on chaotic systems using good integrators. 
Thank you.